You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Welcome to a series called The Leadership Challenge. I'm John Scott, and this is an INCJ podcast on YouTube. Now, there are many different leadership roles in the justice system and many different leadership styles and issues. At our INCJ, we want to give people a conversational opportunity to explore what it means to be a leader and ask questions and find out where those answers might take us. So we've started conversations with many different types of criminal justice leaders to ask about their experiences. And our hope is that by sharing answers with you, it will help find solutions and fresh ideas about improving the systems that we all work in. If you want to follow the series, you'll find it on our website or on a YouTube uh, or a podcast. So look at criminaljusticenetwork.net or on Twitter at INTCJ Network. The title of this podcast is Leading from the Outside. Thank you for joining and listening. Uh, let me introduce today's guest, which is Bill Mather. Hi, Bill. Hi. Um, now, Bill was founder of Social P Pioneers and a former chief executive of the Apex Trust. He currently works as a part-time consultant and is a non-executive director of Primary Care International. Bill has undertaken many international assignments as a program and project leader on criminal justice topics, often as a leader from the outside. So welcome to Bill. Um, tell us where you are today, uh, Bill, and what you're currently working on. Right, well, I'm based in Milton Keynes, and uh, it'll come up later on, I think, uh, why. Um, but I'm working on uh, establishing a new uh, international charity uh, that we hope to see uh, registered and launched um, in the summer, which is the Centre for Strategic and International Government. And this is an area uh, that gets relatively little attention and is absolutely fundamental to how all systems work public services, et cetera, um, and very much including criminal justice. Um, I'm also in the throes of redesigning Social Pioneers, um, which was launched in 2009, um, to uh, move away from it being a consultancy and project operation to being a leadership mentoring and membership organization um, because uh, there is great need for leaders to be talking to each other and talking across disciplines and uh, national boundaries. Now, you chose today's title about leader, leadership from the outside. Now, why, why did you do that? Well, uh, there are two forms of leadership, inside and outside. And I chose to do my influencing um, outside of the system. So I wasn't a civil servant, but I was working with civil servants. Um, I spent a brief period as a social worker and then decided, no, I, I don't want to be in that system. I want to be supporting its development. Um, so the outside has advantages. Uh, it's very much about uh, the freedom to say and do and be where you actually want. Uh, but it has a lot of problems, like you don't have resources. Uh, you don't have um, real responsibility and you have to work with the inside leaders. Um, and the inside leaders are the ones who have got to own the change, make the change real and sustainable. Mm. So 
I took the choice to go on the outside um, because that gave me the freedoms that I needed. Um, and I've lived with the disadvantages of being outside. What turned you off about being in social services then? Well, this was in the very first few weeks of social services being in existence following the Seabone report. And I arrived um, as a community service volunteer to provide some uh, assistance. And I got offered a job as a social worker as they were desperate. Um, and as very early days, it was a bit chaotic. So I inherited a caseload of 281, many of whom I think were dead. But <laughs> it was such a chaotic um, time. Um, but basically what I felt was that I didn't want to be boxed into one particular professional corner. And what I was beginning to realise was that I'm really um, best at adding value at a strategic level rather than a professional technical level. Okay. Well, just to explain to our listeners, we're, we're planning on doing two podcasts because uh, there's a lot of ground to cover. Um and today we're going to be focusing on leadership insights and uh, independent in, uh, perspectives uh, that you're bringing uh, to our uh, thinking. And the next session is going to be uh, on developing methodologies, the work you've done uh, with a, a whole variety of organisations. So the next session is going to be on the how. So shall we start by uh, you telling the story um, Perhaps um, people might be interested to know how we first met Bill and the role you were doing then. Well, I came into the Home Office as a consultant uh, on behalf of um, HM Treasury, which was um, something I was not expecting myself to be um uh, embraced by, uh, but basically what was going on was that the Treasury was at that stage trying to commercialise the civil service. It particularly was focusing on procurement um, and getting value for money out of the really big spend from government departments. But uh, I wasn't part of that. It wasn't to do with the financial norms of Treasury. Treasury was chosen to host um, a consultancy operation um, required by Number 10 because uh, Tony Blair and co were very concerned at the failure to convert uh, policies into practices. And a group of us consultants were recruited as strategic assignment consultant and for mission critical projects placed in the departments to assist as far as one could by applying the experience that we've had in uh, hard delivery organizational growth issues. Um, so Although my early career was in um, management accountancy and systems analysis, uh, that wasn't the reason I was there at all. I, I was selected on the basis that I had a, a, a master's degree. That was a benchmark for election. Um, I'd been chair of our um, hospital audit committee of 100 million turnover. And um, I had the task of trying to help them turn around financial performance, and that had successfully. Um, and I've been a CEO in the voluntary sector for 
20 years of mainly multi-million pound organisations. That suggested to um, Treasury that I could add value and that I had the gravitas to be able to work with very senior civil servants. Mm. Uh, of whom I happen to be one. Now, what did, what did you make of this, the Home Office? Um, well, I did learn an awful lot. First time I was behind the scenes in Whitehall. Um, the Home Office, uh, I mean, each department seems to have its own culture, but there's a common civil service culture. And the civil, civil service culture principally is about um, managing upwards, sort of managing the uh, the ministers, uh, servicing them and trying to make sure that they are satisfied. And so the culture is not about delivering services, generally speaking, and their training is actually very highly focused on policy making, uh, dealing with parliament, and so on. So what I made was a, an assessment of general issues, and the Home Office was going through a real rough time. Uh, this is when it was declared not fit for purpose. Um, and so morale was low, and um, the, there was great uncertainty about where things are going. So uh, that's why eventually there was a spin out of the Ministry of Justice. And your outsider perspective, did, did you find uh, people within the system were keen to listen to you or were they very wary of you? Well, there was a particular team put together for doing the mission critical work. And that team were very good. They were all, well, the three quarters were from the outside. Um, so that team worked well. We all um, learned from each other. The general um, longstanding civil servants were very reluctant alone make change. They were defending their territory, basically, um, particularly the senior civil servants. They had their domain, their power base, and they didn't want anything interfering with it. Um, so that helped me work through, well, how do you meet people where they're at, lead them to where they don't particularly want to go? Um, and that's um, a real issue for leaders. Taking people where they want to go is, is not a strong leadership. Uh, so um, I found a lot of suspicion and resistance and defensiveness. Yeah, and coming from uh, an independent place, uh, were you labelled and your opinions dismissed, or were you able to to get round that? Um, I was able to get round that by t two ways. One was basically um, presenting plans, evidence uh, that uh, built um, some trust and optimism about what is being proposed. Um, and secondly, by ensuring um, engagement, involvement, ownership, every step of the way with the, um, the civil servants and uh, their junior colleague. And that um, was a, a tension at times, you only go at the pace that um, they, they were shit. Um, and you didn't have any authority. So you couldn't tell anyone what to do. 
So that's a real leadership issue because it's different to management. The leadership, you take people on a journey, you use influence and management, you're controlling things, controlling resources and people. And that goes back to the other thing about being an insider. Inside leaders are always appointed and they're appointed with um, management responsibilities. So there's a heavy maintenance management um, whereas outsiders uh, don't have the authority uh, or the responsibility of managing. So in a way, as an independent person, you have to win uh, backing for your ideas uh, you have to win the confidence of people. So it's a relational issue as well as an intellectual issue for you. Very, very much so. Um, and as far as possible, um, make the ideas come from them. You've got your own framework of what you know uh, you're trying to achieve, but it's got to actually be owned, not um handed over to them they've got to build it themselves in their own thinking uh, and so quite often i would start off with asking um a group uh what's your vision you know things can be improved um what would you see as being a world-class service that you could aspire to um so that you're getting people to lift out of their um, day-to-day perspective and to start talking about the change that would really motivate them um, if they could see it materialising. So that's very different to the sort of consultant that's got a, a, a preordained a set of beliefs and then imposes them. You're a more listening sort of guy. Um, completely. Uh, I think, well, I don't have much time for the run-of-the-mill consultants. They, they come in and go out and leave behind um, a doorstop report with lots of advice and sort of health check information. Um Whereas I'm about uh, building the capabilities, uh, understandings um, that make uh, inside leadership work. So I wonder if uh, your method might be seen uh, by uh, the organisation as uh, an outside who comes in, steals all our ideas and, and shapes them as as their company's ideas and tells us what we already knew. Is that is that a, a distortion? It would be because that's not what happened. Um, I'm very much um, about uh, using methodologies that enable um, leadership and change leadership in particular to prosper, be on track and uh, effectively deliver and sustain change. Um, so I tend to feel I own some of the methods, methods but not the uh, anything to do with the technical service. Okay, well, we'll we'll definitely come back and visit this aspect of change uh, in in the next uh, broadcast. But can I ask? Do you operate differently as a consultant with government or say you were called in to work with a charity? Do you do you have different operational modes depending on the type of organisation? Um, that's a good question. Yes. Uh, there's, I mean, charities um, are full of and rather sure on discipline. Um, there are some charities that are focused on empire building, but the majority can't do enough in terms of their cause. 
So they never have enough money, and they find it very difficult uh, often to prioritize, be strategic. Um, that's a very different environment in which you are trying to assist uh, compared with government, where um, policy is actually pretty well dictated by the politicians. Um, the issue is um, mobilizing that policy. Uh, and uh, whereas charities invent whatever they want, they sometimes do. And sometimes they get criticized for it, looking a bit witchy watchy. Um, and they're very much personality led. Uh, and the person who's uh, running the charity will create their own culture. And so you can get a charity branch in one part of the country and then another, but it's supposed to be doing the same thing. They're entirely different. But it is um, a, a different kind of game. And you have to present the, the challenges back to the organisation in a way which is palatable to them. Yes, and invariably what they brought you in for isn't the thing that needs to be done. Um, there's some oversimplistic idea that, that their problem solved. Um, uh, that's often embedded um, and embedded in culture. So um, it's a surprise every time. And sometimes um, I've been engaged as an interim uh, chief executive, and that's always when an organization is, is in crisis. Morale is terrible, rock bottom. They're afraid they're losing their jobs. The finances are all over the place. Um, and so on. And what you've got to do then as a leader is work with uh, what you've got, people that you've got, and to turn them around, positively engaged, future oriented, rather than critical of the past and moaning about being a, a victim of, of lousy management. Um, so Every, every circumstance is different, um, but there are some commonalities, and that includes internationally. But what I have found is that the sensitivity to local cultures um, doesn't mean that uh, there isn't transferability. It means that there is some tuning in the transferability. So there's lots and lots of common ground. Human, human beings are uh, the, the same uh, in different cultures. You, you, you've got to avoid uh, making assumptions that everybody's the same, but you have to look for similarities. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, it is. Um, and if you use my kind of approach, where you're empowering people, and it's their vision, it's their service, it's um, their future, uh, then they will make the adjustment according to their uh, their culture, their traditions, uh, the religious environment or whatever it is. You don't have to get immersed in that because they're going to do that. Um, but you can challenge some of that where... Um, ways of working and belief system are actually um, not conducive modernization and reform. Um, and, that, and that's you know, the old thing, critical friend. Um, that's best done, I think, by a mentoring um, relationship. Yes, I, I want to go back uh, just a few moments to look at when you've arrived at places as the outsider when they're in crisis uh, because being independent 
uh, and maybe arriving uh, for a, a limited period. Does is that quite a powerful time to be independent? It's very powerful. Um, you are expected to move things very quickly. Um, that no change is an option. It, it is not an option. <laughs> but basically, everyone knows that this person coming in is here to clear up the mess. And the first thing you've got to do is build. Um, you won't get anywhere without trust. Change is always about risk uh, and taking risks. Uh, only done um, in a commit committed manner when one trusts that it's likely to be a successful outcome. But you really must move quickly. There are, there's bad wood to cut out. You get rid of the people who are causing the problem within the first weeks. If there is... Um, a failure in terms of um, the organisational management. You must show that you've seen it and that you're addressing it within the first four weeks. Um, so the the normal approach, I think, is, is you've got three months to make your impact. In making that, people got to see you're trustworthy. You're reliable, you're sensible, you're engaging with them, you are a good listener, um, but you're a doer. Uh, and I actually quite enjoy that aspect of work. It's um, uh, make life so much better for the, the, the staff, um, and they blossom, and the services are rescued and sharpened up. So um, the beneficiaries benefit. Okay. I'm wanting to come at this sort of slightly different angle because we started by you having a treasury label attached to you. Uh, around government, people were a bit frightened of uh, men and women from the treasury. But I want to look at the route that took you into that role. Uh, you said you didn't we weren't a money man uh, but my understanding of it was is that you've got a variety of qualifications uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your work or autobiography um it, it's like um a yacht tacking it's not going from a to b in a straight line it's going this way that way and surprisingly when I feel, I don't know why I got sidelined by this, I find I need it in the future. So my first training was a computer programmer and a systems analyst. Um, and systems analysis is a, a darn good skill when you're building or reforming organisations. Um, I trained as an accountant. Um, because my father was an accountant, a family kind of uh, issue. Um, and gosh, you do need to know these figures inside out for running organizations. You can't just depend upon a director of finance. You've got to know yourself. Um, this stage in my career, I was pretty materialistic. Um, I was working very hard. I was um, a management training at the same time. And in my study room, I had pictures up there of all the things I was going to own. A yacht, uh, a big um, holiday home, um, a flashy car. Um, and basically, I was following um, what was expected of me. Somewhere it clicked that actually I want to work for people, not. And 
that took me with my accountancy and systems analyst um, capabilities into first social services, then uh, Milton Keynes Development Corporation, hence why I'm living in Milton Keynes. Um, but those were still in large employers. And what I really wanted was to run a um, national charity. And I took over a charity that had four employees, and it was called Apex. And at its heyday, it had 2,000 employees working in 40 um, towns and cities, uh, established Apex Scotland, um, and it made a huge impact on the issue of employment and sustainability. And there was a reason why I, I stuck there, but not why I applied for it. This is my criminal justice journey beginning. <laughs> so it began with Apex Trust. Um, someone phoned me up and said, vacancy there, why don't you apply? So I applied. I hadn't thought about working with offenders or criminal justice. And then in between the period of notice with Milton Keynes Development Corporation and starting at Apex Trust, um, I learned uh, that my father had gone to prison when I was four years old. That's why the family moved from Lancashire to Kent, because he um, had been a lot of bad publicity, he couldn't get work, um, so he wanted a fresh start. That really muddled my education. Um, and uh, it told a story that was directly relevant to the new role I was taking on. Extra then was the only specialist employment organization working with offenders. Um, and, and today, there are hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, we have to be a pathfinder. We had to show our way through. And because my whole background was shaped by this issue, uh, I was absolutely determined to um, make real change happen. It's interesting because uh, as a, a younger, uh, I'm going to say ambitious person, uh, it sounds to me like you were quite materialistic mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to use your talents to get things. Um, uh, and but you had put your energies into uh, developing uh, systems and ideas in a in a corporate setting in Milton Keynes, and then can take a completely different direction. What, what do you think led to that change? Was it uh, uh, an intellectual change, or what, what do you think it was that was about? Well. I, I think we change by what kind of happens to us that makes us reflect. And in this case, I reinvented myself. So basically, um, it, it was girlfriend trouble. <laughs> so, uh, she went to university and then decided to break it off with me. And I... Up until then, I hadn't thought through anything. I was just doing what was expected. I was going to have 0.1 children, wash the car on Sundays, um, be uh, very successful at work, uh, and, and so on. And losing uh, that relationship meant uh, I had to rethink, because where do I go now? And in that rethinking, which I think is a very important leadership issue, I recognised I was not being authentic. I was being a reflection of expectation and norms that were not mine. So at the same time as 
butchering track, working with people, cropping material guns. I became a vegetarian uh, because that's what I wanted to do. My family will. That didn't go down very well. And this was an era when uh, vegetarianism was around. Um, I started to read philosophy. Uh, so my, my whole sense of discovery and um, my concern to be good news to people and help, helpful in that way rather than good news to an organization. So my last organization, the Waters, I went to, on the people route. The, the chief accountant brought me into his office and said, are you a Bowaters man? And my mouth just dropped open. I thought, what is a Bowaters man? Um, giving your soul to a company. So that was also a trigger, frankly. But um, it was all there inside me anyway. But I had to um, actually recognize it and live it, be authentic and true, and to thrive and prosper. And if you're not doing those things, you can't really be a successful leader. Okay, the, the, I want to come back to the outsider feel because it, your education was messed up by this move to Kent, um, and you've had to get your qualifications the hard way, haven't you? So, yeah, yeah you um, night school, and uh, so there's always been this feel, maybe this feel that the the establishment hasn't helped you. Is that right? Um. Yeah, I, I was a misfit in the educational system. Somehow or other, I passed the 11 plus and went to grammar school. But because our family was poor, living in a poor area, the primary school um, was not very um, good at preparing you for grammar school. And so I was in the bottom uh, class for every single subject. That's um, and I hated it. I really, really loathed um, school. Uh, the careers of vice and the emphasis told the story. Um, the whole uh, approach was to get as many people as possible to bridge, and if not, into a university, and if not, into teacher training. And if you couldn't go into teaching, then the only advice was to go and have an apprentice at apprenticeship at the Chatham Naval Dockyard. And that, that so that the whole ethos of the school was about education for education's sake. And I couldn't buy into that. I need to know what my knowledge is going to be applied to. Um, so this taught me a bit about myself, but it also put me on the side of people who are misfits, people who are excluded. Um, and that, uh, and believing in their talent, uh, their latent capabilities that have not been recognized or nurtured by, uh, by the normal systems. And so that has, really been quite formative to me um, and given my later change away from norms of materialism um, it's made me a more confident and clear person um, just because I'm being me and in a way the fact that you've achieved so much uh, ended up with a master's degree, even though you were seen as a failure in your school, it gives you a confidence which you wouldn't have got if you'd just been a yes person. No. Um, I'm, a, I'm quite entrepreneurial, really. 
Um, and I really enjoy developing ideas. Um, I don't have to have them as my ideas, but seeing ideas that could make a real difference and seeing if they could uh, become uh, fact. Uh, and I think quite a lot of entrepreneurs are not good in the educational system. Like Br uh, Branson, for example. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have we can understand, I think, your uh, passion for doing something about uh, employment in the criminal justice system, uh, seeing what impact your, your father going to prison had upon you as a family, uh, having to move and all that sort of thing. Where does your uh, heart for global issues come from? getting involved in international stuff? Um, I suppose my uh, my passion is about circle. And you can't, in this interdependent, well-connected world, um, deal with um, systems uh, divorced from the global context. So the global context is one where the rule of law is under attack. Authoritarianism, right-wing politics, um, the uh, on judges, the independents, um, the hidden corruption. Uh, as, and this is why I'm focusing on governments at the moment. Um, all of these th things, they spread. <laughs> they are, and you can see them spreading. Um, so one needs to uh, be making contributions where there are um, courageous leaders and cross-fertilizing um, from um, system to system, country to country, um, so that people can uh, make sense of change and feel uh, that they're going to see them through and they're see them through the resistances and the risks. I also greatly enjoy working with different love diversity. Um, but one thing to, that I haven't said is, is that the thing about working in the criminal justice with Apex was that's where I learned about the real professionalism within criminal justice and the dedication and commitment and the frustration. And the frustrations are huge. Um, and the caring is genuine. And uh, I felt um, that if there was anywhere that um, I, I should focus on, it's, it's enabling that uh, talent, commitment, and capability to prosper in order that rule of law um, becomes trusted and effective mechanism. And I'm, I feel that um, you don't get let down by people in the criminal justice. You really get right up the top. And then, uh, they are really difficult people, not all of them, uh, certainly relating to the prison service, um, very risk-averse, conservative, um, uh, command and control, old style. But where that's happening, it's surprising innovation and um, capabilities of, of the Wilson system. Uh, so these are things I like to work at.
Okay. Um, we're coming to towards the end of this this particular uh, broadcast. Um, I, I'd like to look at what you think the crossover learning into international development work is from your consultancy. Um, I'll give you um, one example. Uh, when you're pioneering something, and social pioneers, um, it means that there are very few comparators. And if there are very few comparators, there's very little to learn from. And there is a, um, uh, a real difficulty in taking the, the, the risk of steps forward. So by my experience, people are uh, looking for where this has already been done before. But frankly, um, one is working quite a lot of the time on things with people who are trying to do things that have never been done before in exactly those circumstances. So in the ex-Soviet um, country of Kazakhstan, um, the general prosecutor wanted to see another ex-Soviet country who reformed its prosecutor service. Well, there wasn't one. No way. Uh, so, um, that as an example uh, is about how you can show the principles of pioneering. Um, as opposed to the examples of uh, copycat possibilities. But they're few and far between, and they're quite often in very different circumstances. But the principle of change, which um, I've applied and I've helped others to apply, um, fairly major change. Uh, an example of that was... Um, getting the EU to um, designate its offenders priority group for the social fund, out of which hundreds of millions of pounds has been um, made available in the UK alone. Um, so you can shift policies, resources, practices, uh, systems effectiveness and cultures. A lot comes down to culture. Um, that's what you can trade nationally with the, the mechanisms that make them feel and, and actually do get them in control. Um, so it's not so much taking technical expertise as taking the methodologies and the proof of concept of undertaking change okay so we're going to uh, sign off now with a question about leadership needs internationally what do you see uh, are the biggest challenges in the international justice sector um i think the one i've already alluded to is the context within which criminal justice is so they're more authoritarian right-wing um, uh, that you can't make progress against a current that is going the opposite direction uh, without busting a gut. <laughs> and uh, so you've got to somehow or other um, influence broader than criminal justice in criminal justice uh, operations. Um, secondly, there is a, um, a hell of a lot of interdependence in this world today. If you see it, live it fundamentally, economically, uh, about food supply, uh, pandemic, climate change, and so on. So the international scene has got to be strengthened and joined up. And 
uh, it, it's got to become a kind of social movement, um, helping each other, sharing lessons, um, and feeling part of um, a evolution to get a criminal justice fit for this very fast changing world. So these these are the are the are the big things, and finally, public trust. Uh, it's going downhill pretty well everywhere, and on operate criminal justice uh, as a, a distrusted um, part of society's blue, um, and so the public should be involved. Uh, in ways that are meaningful, not just have a voice. And that is not something that we're used to. Criminal justice tends to be fairly private, security conscious, and so on. And hence, you get the institutional problems we've been hearing about. Um, it's not purposefully done, um, but it is because it's, uh, it's detached from um the general progress and changes that society is going through. So those are the three. Thank you. So we're going to end there. Please remember to join us for part two of this discussion, which is going to look uh, at the how and the sorts of methodologies that Bill has used in different parts of the world uh, to get uh, leaders and organisations to address change in a meaningful way. way. We're going to be putting uh, references and materials online to go along with these two podcasts and hope that you find, find those useful. So in the meantime, please stay safe and we hope that you can join us next time. Goodbye and thank you very much for listening. Other podcasts are available on your normal provider through iTunes or Google under INCJ Podcasts. You have been listening to the INCJ Podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.